it is one of the major clinics on the Latin America region. And we are used to uh, have international patient departments and people from Bolivia or, or other countries on the region come um, because of insurances, because of uh, high complexity specialties. Uh, so uh, this is the case, uh, and it's very important for us to share with you this experience. So uh, please, uh, Dr. Gomez, uh, you can start with the clinical case. Thank you, Dr. Solar. As Dr. Solar was telling you, this is a pretty interesting case that was delivered to us. And here we, we go. This is a 67 years old male. He was born and raised in Cochabamba, Bolivia. His past medical history consists on hypertension, coronary artery disease with uh, myocardial infarction, and hypercholesterolemia. He's on usual meds, omeprazole, aspirin, clopidogrel, diltiazem, and pitabastatin. And he's a businessman. He works indirectly supervising cattle workers of pigs and bovine livestock. He started in mid-November of 2023 with an intense abrupt onset lumbar pain uh, that uh, the, the, uh, ends up limiting his daily activities, but otherwise healthy. Uh, no other particular uh, symptoms were referred at the time. And he started a first study in Bolivia where they were performed a lumbar x-ray that defines a grade one spondylolisthesis with a discrete L5-S1 instability. Uh, Progressing with the study, they performed an MRI in the, the same month and, and described uh, vertebral bodies of L3, L4 edema. Then, and spine CT in January for persistence of the symptoms in 2024, uh, there are all, already signs of a frank spondylolisthesis in L3, L4 vertebral bodies uh, with compromise of the L3, L4 disc. Either. There, they performed their first uh, etiological study, suspecting an spondylolisthesis, <laughs> and performed blood cultures that were negative, and tuberculin skin test that was negative also. They performed a surface echocardiogram that shows no uh, particular findings suggestive of endocarditis, just some sequela of his previous myocardial infarction. And they perform a surgical approach, uh, performing a vertebral biopsy that shows nothing more than healthy mature bone, no signs of neoplastic tissue, uh, scarce polymorphonucleus infiltration. Uh, and in the micro area, they perform gram stain that was negative and seal nissen stain that was negative also. And the cock culture at the moment of presentation were pending results. They also performed from uh, Brussels serology that was negative. So at this time, I would like to ask to the audience, what would you think with the differential diagnosis with the elements that are presented in the form of the presentation of the case, in the form of the uh, possible diagnosis, and in, in even if, uh, if anyone could uh, suspect any kind of etiology? Thank you, Felipe. So, um... Is uh, any volunteer to make a comment about differential diagnosis and workup? Hi, Sebastian. This is Jorge. Hi, Jorge. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you for the, the presentation. Please, uh, could you could you uh, could you show the previous slide, please? Yes, sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, 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 thank you. Well, this is the in, in Peru. This is relatively common uh, to see patient with a spondylolisthesis. The common etiology is some opportunity is tuberculosis, no? Uh, for disease is relatively common here, but. Uh, another option in, 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 in this context, no, patient from Bolivia, no, and uh, a part of TV, no, is, uh, another option is uh, Brussela, no, and I don't know if the patient uh, travel around to the uh, uh, jungle area with 
possible endemic uh, mycosis, no, such as uh, paracoicidomycosis, histoplasmosis. Even I know uh, in Bolivia uh, there there are cases of uh, epoxidoidomycosis too. Um, in immunosuppressor patient, obviously you can see uh, probably uh, aspergillus no, or an, another invasive mycosis, no? even in some opportunity, some cases of uh, uh, zygom zygomycosis. Um, in non-infectious diseases, obviously the malignancy is, is, is a good option, but uh, I, in my opinion, do continue to search TB because it's the more common in, in prevalent areas such as Peru and Bolivia. Okay, as probable is it's not easy to, to obtain diagnosis with the first samples. No, even in some opportunity, you need to, to take an, a new biopsy no, and perform a new study. And it's very interesting to use uh, molecular tests, no, such as, uh, for example, gene expert. We use gene expert for tissue. No, obviously, in the in the first times. Uh, no, previous years, the uh, gene expert was was uh, uh, was useful in only sputum. Currently, we use gene expert in another context, or you use another um, another PCR method uh, to rule out a TB. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doctor Alave. Yeah, is uh, the uh, clinical reasoning based on epidemiology helps a lot when you have a negative test, um, and we're gonna do another round of tests and some things we can solve in our center. Others has to be sent to a referral laboratory, and others are not available. But certainly, uh, this uh, hypothesis based upon uh, exposure are important to be uh, considered. Is there any other one interesting comment? Uh, in regards to the cases that we see here in the US, uh, I mean, tuberculosis is not the most common. What we see here uh, in the setting of uh, Discarius osteomalaris is uh, regular bacteria, meaning MRSA, that's a community acquired MRSA will be the most common isolated in this situation. Uh, I'm kind of uh, surprised that the bacteria biopsy is not showing any uh, osteo consistent uh, co with osteomyelitis, actually. But I, I guess uh, maybe you uh, or the person who did it uh, didn't uh, catch the, the right uh, point of infection in there. I mean, that's possible. But uh, for us, will be Staphylococcus uh, RS, MRSA, Streptococcus, and in people that have uh, other ports of entry, for example, in uh, elderly men with uh, UTIs, they can actually have grand negative uh, osteomyelitis as well. Um, the rest, I think I agree with Dr. Alabi, we have to consider other uh, atypical causes of uh, osteomyelitis here. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, actually, well, for us, the most common uh, etiology is bacterial and, and uh, Staphylococcus, uh, enterococcal infection also, and uh, on gram negatives, uh, especially with the previous history of uh, urinary tract infection, we've seen sometimes uh, this manifestation uh, as a secondary seed of the of the bacteria. And on the other hand, by the age of the patient, uh, plasmocytoma, it's uh, an interesting non-infectious disease lesion that might be misleading. Uh, diagnosis. And the, um, the accuracy of biopsy depends a lot on, on how expert is the team that performed the procedure and your image guidance. Uh, so, so some specialist has a lot of experience, many, many patients, but if you're not trained or the patient has uh, anatomic, uh, anatomic uh, difficulties, even if you're very experienced, you may not get a very representative sample. So, so uh, it depends case on case. Uh, how do you get 
a, a representative sample or or not. Okay. So uh, let's continue, uh, Dr. But just uh, uh, this, Matthias from Newcastle. I I concur with what everybody's been saying. Similar, the same things with uh, Staph aureus being the most common, and other bacterial causes as the main causes. Uh, <clears throat> TB is clearly a, 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 a risk in patients where there is a sort of often an identifiable risk factor and where there is a, another association, but the vast majority is, as you, as you said. I was impressed to see that your the surgeons uh, uh, very quickly do biopsy here. We struggle to get our surgeons to do uh, a biopsy. Uh, so often for us, it is a CT, uh, mainly CT guided approach, um, uh, if we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahid. I appreciate your comments. Yeah. Okay, uh, before we continue with the case, uh, I want to take some things that uh, already have been said and talk about this and this scenario of spondylolisitis with, with negative cultures. First, we should all be aware of there are pyogenic causes of spondylitis decitis and the non-pyogenic. And we are pretty aware of the common causes of the usual bacteria that produce this kind of disease, the gram-positive cocci, the staphylococcus aureus, the streptococcus pyogenes, in the gram-negative area, coli, proteus, pseudomona, and sometimes even anaerobic bacteria that uh, all could be causes of spondylodicitis decitis and the yield of the cultures are very variable in the literature. And in the non-pyogenic area, that is where the most common uh, causes of culture negative, we find, as, as already been said, mycobacterium tuberculosis, other kind of mycobacteria, brucella, and other fungi. Uh, another less virulent bacteria like viridan group streptococci, propionibacteria, and coagulasa negative staphylococci. Just to remember that the yields of the blood cultures in this kind of pathology is uh, referred around 50%. So in the first uh, round of studies, uh, the negative results of blood culture almost never said nothing more. Second, the, the, the aspect of the need to uh, perform a guided biopsy usually is very, uh, for us is important, but when you look at the literature and see was the, the performance of the test. Usually uh, in, the, in the analysis performed there, it's not more than one third of the cases that it gives you additional information than the cultures. It's important, it's not a less number, but it's not the uh, first wonder for the first study. And Dr. Alave uh, recalls for the second uh, intent of performing the, result, the, the procedure, and in this case, when you perform a second biopsy plus culture in the with the CT guided study, the truth is that it gives you something more, but it, it this didn't give another fifty percent in the best cases of the of, of the scenario. This study, of course, are, are limited. What what's the cause for the second study? Is it a failure of treatment? Is it just to pursue? Uh, microbiology, so the yields of the results are usually a little bit stained with the, the causes and the performance of the, the study that we look. And the other thing that should be aware for us is what's the deal with having a spondylodicitis with negative uh, culture? Is it worse? Is it better? Does it matter? Uh, and, this, and the truth is that I, I found at least three or four studies that look for this uh, subject. And in this first one, this was a, a retrospective study, 69 patients uh, with a different range of uh, microbiology isolated, but 26 patients uh, have no, uh, no study resolved this kind of stuff. And uh, they were compared in demographics, clinical findings, morbidity, and general left. And the truth is that there are some risk factors for uh, having a, a negative culture and we'll see what's happened with uh, the results. And the truth is that it's, it's appeared that the diabetic and people that had previously an intervention of the spine are at higher risk of uh, uh, not, be able, not being able to isolate any kind of culture. In the other, in the other hand, when we compare the kind of lab presentation, 
The people with negative culture are usually less inflammated. We uh, represented this by, uh, by a, a, a lower CRP and with a lower globular sedimentation rate. And finally, uh, the other thing that it's important for us is these negative cultures mean we are giving more antibiotics, the outcomes changes. And to be truth, uh, there was no difference between culture negative or culture positive in this first scenario of a culture negative spondylodicitis is how much antibiotics we give to people and uh, the, the um, uh, approach in the area of surgery, uh, surgical approach, bracing of the, of the patients, or a mean duration of the uh, stability support for the spine. This other study, uh, it's also a retrospective study, uh, 18 years old patients. They analyzed, uh, analyzed uh, 151 cases between 2000 and 2012. Uh, they excluded uh, patients with um, mycobacteria or other slow growth bacteria. Uh, and they show by in the cases of suspected exclusively usual bacteria that there were no observed difference in the group with uh, with a confirmed diagnosis and with just clinical diagnosis of spondylodicitis in the duration of antibiotic therapy or the uh, amount of surgical procedures needed. But there was a little slight tendency to treatment failure in the group of microbiology confirmed. That could be sound a little bit strange because if you have the bacteria, you would think that the therapy will be directed, by, but otherwise, when you identify the bacteria, you have a, an, a large inoculum or you have more pyogenic bacteria, more aggressive stuff. And this is what it shows, the, that the uh, clinical uh, time free of treatment failure is usually slower in the people that have uh, isolated bacteria. And what other factors were associated with treatment failure? High fever, the RCP levels at the diagnose that as we recall in the previous study was also uh, related with isolation of, of uh, microbiology. And the uh, people with microbiology confirmed spondylo decided uh, had a little uh, higher uh, rates of recurrence or treatment failure. And but this doesn't still solve the question of what's happened with the people with uh, culture negative. And this other study reunites more evidence, uh, summarized more studies. And they have seen that there are data that support worse outcomes. And, this is, and there's data that shows no difference. For, for example, Hopkins uh, they find that have more death in the groups uh, with negative culture, but the the number of patients is low. Uh, in the same group in 2016, they have an uh, this dif differs with the other study that said that the, here they have the longer treatment. Uh, in this poll at all 2018, it was a prognostic factor that. Maybe it's that uh, that most logical thing that you would uh, thought in this scenario. On the other hand, there are also a lot of uh, literature that say that nothing is different when you have a culture negative versus culture positive. In the scenario of relapses or recurrences, uh, no difference in any outcomes in the cases of success of treatment, sequ clinical sequela, the rate of treatment failure, but the, in, in the final message of this part is that it's not still uh, uh, clear what, uh, it, what impact will have in the treatment of this kind of disease if you have no isolated microbiology. Going back to the clinical case, the patient travels to Chile for a second opinion. At first visit, the patient has no ill aspect, has no palpable adenopathies, no respiratory symptoms or distress. The lumbar pain was felt at deep palpation, and he manifest and was evident difficulties to sit down, stand up, and lay down. Otherwise, there were no other remarkable findings at the physical exam. His lab, he shows no anemia, uh, no uh, particular leukocytosis, but a little bit of neutrophilia. His platelet count was normal. His GSR was 48. His C reactive protein was 3.73 milligrams per deciliter. 
uh, and the other biochemical profile was non-remarkable. Another MRI was performed, and the inform says that there was progression of the L2, L4 alterations showed in the previous MRI. Uh, the previous images were loaded at the system, so the radiologist had a comparative point, but shows also actually trended inflammatory vertebra phenomena with inflammatory findings in the insertions of the source. And the, the radiologists also add a commentary saying that considering the time of evolution, the findings, uh, it should be considered a spondylodicitis from a low virulence pathogen. And this is a, a, a recommendation from the radio team. We started again a, a workup. This time we performed, we added a Bertonella Hensel IgG that was negative. We repeat an a, a TB test as an L spot this time that shows zero spots. But this time the blood cultures uh, were positive in two of our four bottles. And the Brussels serology was repeated in the first console. But this time the, the um, uh, results came positive. The, the serology is not performed at Clinical Alemana. We send it to a reference lab. And at the first time, the result was just positive. There's, there was no IB titer. Uh, but with communication with the reference lab, they said, or they informed us by a telephonic man manner, that it was highly positive. So in this scenario, there was also another thing that was important, that when the blood cultures came out positive, uh, the clinical team contact the labs and uh, as the suspicious of a, bar of a, of a, bar of a Brusella etiology was started, uh, the lab was uh, advised to uh, send the bottles of cultures to the reference National Laboratory, the Institute of the, the Health, National Health Institute, uh, because the lab doesn't count with the uh, biosecurity level need for this kind of pathogen. And then the results of the, um, of the cultures informed uh, a Brucella abortus in both bottles. So with this information, uh, what would be the the treatment approach from uh, from our, our, our point of view, the antibiotics, what would we do? We have a Brucella abortus, we have high titers, and we have the otherwise study negative. Hi, Felipe. Well, thank you for... Um... Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting to the approach in, in Chile, different to the to Bolivia. But uh, currently, there are there are many many problems to the Brusella test because it's the um, in some opportunity some labs use different antigens. So for this reason, it's possible you obtain negative results in one laboratory and positive results in another laboratory. Uh, but the, the idea is in, in our country, for, for, example, for example, in Peru, when we suspect of uh, brucellosis, we perform the test in, in different laboratories. The idea is obtain at least two uh, uh, set of uh, brucella tests uh, two, two sets because it's very important to rule out uh, this, this diagnosis. And another option if you suspect of uh, Brucella is obtain a uh, sample of the bone marrow. No, it's another uh, interesting area to obtain the diagnosis. Obviously, currently, the gold standard is uh, the blood quarter, No, In the past, you know, the gold standard was the bone marrow culture was very useful too. Uh, well, the treatment is is not different. You no, know? uh, currently uh, we use uh, doxycycline uh, plus um, uh, amino glucosides. You no, know? but amino glucoside uh, we use for only one week. Even in some opportunities, some some people use two week, no, specifically gentamicin. No, another in the previous guidelines, the WHO recommend uh, doxycycline plus uh, rifampicin. But currently, 
no, uh, apparently, no, the doxycycline plus amino glucoside is better, better, better than the, the previous, uh, previous uh, regimen, no, with, uh, with uh, refunding, no. Uh, the use aspects of uh, neurological involvement, such as, I don't know, meningitis or uh, a CNS involvement. Some people use you know, doxycycline, amino glucoside, and uh, cotimoxazole. You know, in, in some opportunity, we use uh, that tri this, this combination uh, for one week, and then we continue with only doxycycline and uh, cotrimoxazole. I talk about that because it's possible that the lesions uh, uh, involvement the the, the uh, meningeals or the medullal. Uh, it's possible the patient have a CNS involvement. This, uh, sorry, if, if the question was if the patient has in CNS a commitment, it, uh, uh, no, there was no signs of infection of the CNS and the neurological exam of the, uh, uh, the sh doesn't, doesn't show anything. Anyone else wants to add something to Dr. Alave? Okay, I'll go on. Effectively, the started treatment with an associated treatment of doxycycline, gentamicin, and rifampicin, and was discharged 10 days later after we, the, the pain team has uh, evaluated him, and the surgical team also the, uh, says that there's but nothing else to do. We have no local complication, no abscess, no epidural, no source complication. And then he was discharged, he completed uh, 10 days of gentamicin and was discharged with doxycycline plus rifampicin for 12 weeks in the, uh, in the follow-up in Bolivia. So the final diagnosis is a brosilla abortus spondylodicitis. And here I want to uh, talk about a little bit of brosilla and its systemic commitment. Brucella, as, as all we know, it's a worldwide distribution zoonosis it's a gram-negative cocobasali non-capsulated. It's an intracellular pathogen. He's aerobic, non-motile, non-spore forming, and, for, uh, uh, and it's a slow-growing pathogen. It's a catalase oxidase negative, and there are at least six renowned species. As was, I was reading at the last moment, there were now 12 recognized species, but only four uh, with human infective capacity, that is Brucella abortus, Melitensis, Suis, and Canis. The cycle of the pathogen usually starts in, a, in an infected uh, cattle or, or bovine or pigs, and it entered the host in the human as an accidental host by, by aspiration, by direct contact, or by a, a professional exposure on the veterinary area. Usually the human being is an opportunistic host, uh, the infection also is associated with the consumption of uh, products of the dairy kind of products. And the lab exposure is associated with the veterinary area, farmers, slaughterhouses, hunters, shepherds, clinical laboratory staff, uh, mainly in the, in the form of placenta exposure, stillbirth attendings, uh, inhalation of infected aerosolized particles that was, I was referring with when we talk about the, the, the um, derivating the blood cultures to the reference labs, uh, even in the exposures of wounds or mucosal membranes. Uh, exceptionally, it's also been described by raw meat consumption, and in more uh, exclusive cases, also been described in human-to-human -human contact. The brucellosis, the disease caused by brucella, is also known as the Mediterranean fever, the Malta fever, or the undulant fever. And it caused over 500,000 cases over worldwide in, annually. It has a global distribution. It's present in the US, in the Mediterranean, in South America, in Central America, in the Eastern Europe, in Africa, and in the Middle East, if no one's safe. 
And the acute presentation is usually after a two month period of incubation and the symptoms are very, very non-defining. It presents as a almost influenza-like fever, headache, myalgia, arthralgia, uh, and sometimes in the physical exam, you can find hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, lymphadenopathy. Uh, but in the form of the uh, chronic uh, infestation, you usually would see more systemic manifestation and the more prevalent are the gastrointestinal manifestations, mainly hepatitis, pancreatitis, cholecystitis. And, <laughs> and the second most frequent is the, osteo, uh, is the osteoarticular compromise, where you can find osteolytic lesions, articular effusions, you can find all kinds of uh, arthritis or um, synovitis. The least frequent, thank God, is the CNS and peripheral nervous system manifestation. Usually, to also can present as dermatological complication, and the most feared is the endocarditis associated. The diagnostic workup is usually, as Dr. Labe was saying, is is hard, is not that secure, and the sens the sensitivity of the blood cultures has been getting better with the time. But in the better uh, scenarios it's fluctuated from 10 to 90% of, of the results with the systematized, uh, systematized uh, systems. Uh, the, more, uh, the, more, the better yield results is usually from bone marrow cultures that is defined at up to 90% in the better scenarios. And usually the diagnosis relies more on serologies, agglutination tests, uh, amplification of nucleic acids or, the, or um, and universal PCR with the amplification of ribosomal RNA. And as we are saying, uh, when you see that there are that many uh, uh, tests, usually that means that none is it's better or none is perfect. So usually the direct culture is one of the main criteria for the diagnosis defined by the CDC. But the indirect serological test, as you see, you have the most used is the Rosa Bengal test that screen for IgG and RGM, but has low sensitivity and has a false positive results with many other bacteria like Yersinia. The standard agglutination test uh, is uh, directed against the smooth lipoparisaccharide of the of the brucella. Uh, but it has the problem that is not useful for Brucella canis infection. I'll also have a high rate of false negative in complicated and chronic cases. So as we can be reading this table, that's not the point of the slide, is just to show that when you have many tests, usually that because none of, the, of them is usually perfect and you should and they should not be used to uh, certainly rule out the condition. The criteria for the diagnostic the proposed by the CDC usually is divided in two groups, the presumptive diagnose and the definitive diagnose. And in the presumptive diagnose, you should, should have an IV titer of 160, but this is for the non-endemic area. In endemic areas, it's, it's, it's suggested that the point of the cutoff point should be 320. And the detection of DNA in a clinical sample, as you can see, and it would be strange to, to assume this, but it's also in the presumptive diagnosis. And the definitive diagnosis is from cultures. Cultures positive and identification of brucella in a clinical sample, or, or the other thing that it's accepted is the uh, amplification of ribosomal RNA, or the other thing is a change in the titers at four fourfold change in the titer of antibodies uh, between the acute phase in the seven first days of evaluation and two to four weeks of uh, the presentation. Here is another form of presentation. This, the suppressed brucellosis, uh, re relies in the culture, the serological tests, and the amplification of nuclear acids. And when you have culture plus serology, usually is confirmed uh, uh, brucellosis. When you have none on them, you can, with some certainty, exclude brucellosis. And when you have serology plus a, a, a nuclear acid amplification, it's still a probable brucellosis until you have a positive culture. 
the suspected brucellosis should be arise when you have only the serology. And of course, when none of them are present or only the nuclear acid amplification test, you should repeat the serology mainly to see if you have presentation of these fourfold changes in the tigers. Sorry. And the treatment, this is uh, independent for the kind of presentation. As Dr. Alave was saying, it is mainly based in doxycycline, some aminoglycosid, and rifampicin. Uh, the treatment duration according to the clinical phase start at least with six weeks of, of treatment. And there are other um, alternatives to this scheme. Streptomycin is usually referred in, lit in the literature. Cotrimoxazole, as Dr. Alai was saying, when you have intolerance to other of the drugs or you have CNS compromised. And even ofloxacin is, uh, or ciprofloxacin is uh, recommended in other scenarios. And what happened with those articular brucellosis that well, it's what brings us here? Uh, the articular manifestation of brucella may be part of uh, the acute presentation or the chronic phase. And it can compromise the, the skeletal system in up to 85% of, of the cases of infection. And the main uh, presentation, this is more centered in the pediatric population also, is the unilateral sacroiliac joint infection. And the second most frequent is the spinal joint, and up to half of the patients could present this in the form of spondylitis, spondylitis, with a certain uh, uh, preference to affect the lumbar vertebra, secondly, the thoracic vertebra, and in the last place, the cervical vertebra. Other kind of manifestation is the articular brucellosis, is peripheral arthritis, osteomyelitis, bursitis, and tenosynovitis. And, and, and just to say, it can affect any kind of the osteoarticular system. The radiologic findings the, depends on the, on the manifestation. You can find localized form, uh, usually compromising the L4, L5 portion, and this is in the, in the acute presentation of uh, brucellosis. And the, and the findings are really not that significant. You can find some uh, osteopenia, a little bit of um, uh, uh, spinal degenerative signs, but they are also very late in the in the clinical presentation. They usually start being uh, evident within the three to five weeks after the infection. And the diffuse form that is the more complicated, of course, is the compromise of the wall vertebrae body that uh, talks about the time left uh, growing the infection. Uh, and it usually have extension to other disc and could have affection of uh, paravertebral and, and epidural space with manifestations of abscess. The MRI have no specific, specific findings in concern to other etiologies of spondylodicitis, so it does, it does not suggest anything particular. And you have a, a hypo -A intense signal on T1 and hyperintensity on T2 weight on it and steering images right, with particular enhance in the disc. The surgical management is usually uh, not the first line, but it requires in, in up to 30% of the patients. And it's usually to, man to management of complications, to compressive symptoms, to drain uh, abscess, to uh, stabilize bone deformities or spinal instability. And the procedure is usual, not different also, is laminectomies, corporectomies, uh, any kind of technique that goes to decompress the medulla. In this case, when is there's osteoarticular compromise, the recommended therapy is prolonged from the six weeks that we talked recently to three to six months. And there's another thing that's important with osteoarticular brucellosis that it have a that it may recur, even with a well, it is the risk reduces with prolonged therapy. But there's this is a percentage of patients that have, will be presenting with recurrence of the manifestation. And in the aspect of the uh, recommendations for prophylactic therapies, the truth is that there are no formal guidelines to uh, the, for the post-exposure prophylaxis, but some uh, some literature recommends uh, doxycycline for three weeks in the case of a high-risk expo exposition. Finally, to end up this, uh, we have to uh, remember that brucella is a worldwide distribution. It should always be in our differential diagnosis in this kind of a scenario with negative cultures. 
the acute infection is undistinguishable from other minor infections that should uh, that could uh, uh, that could uh, distract us from the main, from the important. Uh, it produces systemic involvement, mainly of articular manifestations and gastrointestinal manifestations in the chronic phases. And the diagnosis is complex and is based on clinical suspicion, serology, and identification of the pathogens in clinical samples with negative results, thus precluding the diagnose only just to be percent that we should, if the suspicion is high, to repeat and re uh, till we are completely sure. The treatment is associated, is prolongated, uh, recurrence risk is well-defined. And the problem with this is that many patients will not be able to tolerate the extension of the treatment. So this is what I was uh, was going to show you, and um, I, I appreciate your attention. Dr. Schmidt? Hello, Felipe. Thank you. This was a very good and comprehensive talk, guys. Uh, 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 talk. Uh, I have a, a question with regards to when you have patients, uh, and quite often I think this will be the case, that you have ultimately no diagnosis, and you still think there's a you know there's an epidemiological risk and of <clears throat> and potential brucella cannot be excluded. Do you then uh, in those patients where you have absolutely no positive result? Would, do you still uh, what what kind of antibiotic treatment do you use? Do you use a treatment that will include brucella type as a as a differential, or do you just give like in the UK, brucella clearly is not uh, common uh, or uh, or rarely diagnosed uh, in patients who have a no diagnosis, even with sixteen S and eighteen S of like. Uh, amplification and and uh, we often give just like a, a broad spectrum antibiotic uh, for six to twelve weeks in those discitis patients, and a substantial number will improve. Uh, and some where there is likely no infectious cause in the end may not. But what's your approach locally? Wow, it's a it's a hard question. Brucella in Chile is not that common. It's not a, it's not what we usually think when we have a culture negative uh, spondylolisitis, even in this in the scenario of uh, epidemiological risk. Because even in that scenario, we don't have that that much uh, brucella. I don't know if the doctor Solaris agree with me, but. I think that the main uh, assumption would be that it's a usual bacteria, and we don't, when we don't have a, a, a certain etiology, we usually give a broad spectrum, but not thinking in Brucella, we usually discover staphylococci and gram-negative. So the scheme is actually directed to that. I, I don't recall. We don't, I don't recall uh, that these years of the fellow giving any empirical treatment with uh, brucella coverage. But uh, it's, I, I would think, or I would believe that the this kind of question have different answers here in Peru, in Bolivia, in the US. But uh, here for us, I don't think that we would go with a prolonged therapy for brucella suspicion, even in this kind of epidemiological scenario. Yeah. Dr. Salar, please. It's very, uh, it's very interesting your question me. and comment, uh, Dr. Schmidt. Um, most of time, uh, we do not have to go for the second serology to see if it's fourfold, and we appreciate a clinical response to a surgery uh, or to antibiotic alone. And it's a coincidence that. Most of times we use a quinolone or a cotrimoxazole as empiric therapy. Um, very few times we decided to continue on doxycycline as an empiric therapy. Uh, and what protects us more from this scenario is that we have very, very few patients with exposure to uh, brucellosis risk. Um, that, that means people like this patient coming from from a very uh, very high risk exposition or travelers, so so that's uh, like a backup for us not to empirically treat uh, brucella combining rif rifampicin. 
Um, and on the other hand, if we have hardware and we use a quinolone, well, sometimes we add refamping, but based on the uh, uh, micro on the biofilm rather than thinking about Brucella. So, so uh, what we try to do is to obtain um, a representative sample from the uh, site of infection and do it as soon as we can and go for molecular tests and cultures and, and everything. Uh, so th that means that when resu results are negative, uh, even if we consider what Dr. Alave said about the precision and the technique of the antibodies, we feel uh, very confident when results are negative for Brucella in our experience. And, and, and a very, very good backup for that is the very low prevalence of disease in our patients. I mean, I, I fully agree that I mean, uh, you, you need to have a very, very pragmatic view and you need to go by what, what is common things are common and, you know, um, and then use your skill in history taking and, and association uh, that is vital, like it was in clearly in, in this patient was much more <clears throat> um, risk associated than it would be with a standard Chilean patient. Um, so that's been very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fumit. And, and, and what was very important in terms of biosafety was to inform the laboratory about the culture, because yeah. uh, even if we are not used to have a confirmation of Brucella and that it's not common to get that on cultures, since we were thinking about that, and we have uh, high suspicions and we were going on with the serology. Well, uh, that report uh, uh, was uh, teamwork to prevent a major incident on the laboratory. So, so be aware of that if you're thinking about Brucella, searching Brucella, or you're, uh, even if you're dabbing about a true positive serology, uh, please remember to inform those who are involved on the sample management to take precautions and not to expose to these agents. I have a question regarding the treatment. Do you follow the antibiotic susceptibilities in here? Is there any concern for the rifampin uh, resistance? I mean, in the literature, it says that it can go up to 20%. Do you consider that in, for your treatment or at least for de-escalation or maybe to escalate if needed? Well, basically our reasoning on this uh, selection of antibiotic is that uh, the patient, we consider him fragile for the use of aminoglycose, but, but we rely on that on the first weeks, uh, the oh, first, first and a half week then. And then we move on based on availability for, for refamping. Uh, we will discuss about the addition or switch to coltrimoxazole uh, combined with oxycycline. Uh, however, we since we do not have that full information in this case or, or with this sample, we decide to move on with refampicin and follow up uh, and, and well our senior uh, infectious disease that was in charge as an outpatient uh, has uh, uh, the report of, of a good clinical response. So then we didn't, did not uh, question about resistance uh, later. We, we accepted that further. And is it typically performed in the referral uh, center that you're talking, the susceptibilities for Priscilla, or they don't do it? I don't know if, we, if they do it on, on demand, uh, but I think we have the full report uh, since it's been six weeks from or, or five weeks from the, that sample. And all we have is the confirmation of a species. So, so uh, as long as I know, it's not something we have available. Um, probably we, we, we don't have a direct communication. There, there is a, a person in charge for um, a referred test to other laboratories and the, and the center is uh, kind of closed so that, that person may ask that question later but uh, as far as we know pro we, we do not have that information uh, now thank you 
All right. Well, today, uh, Felipe made an innovation. Uh, he kind of split the review uh, in an effort to make comprehensive and set the background for what to do when you are facing a second consultation. Um, that helps the team uh, because many things has been considered, but makes uh, harder because you have more expectations and you may feel pressure about getting the final answer. Uh, so uh, that's what that was an effort to depict how we face and what the literature says about it and later to review about the treatment and fundamentals. So, so uh, we really appreciate all your comments. Uh, you make very good considerations about uh, treatments of, cho uh, of choice. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez uh, gave, so, gave some words about uh, resistance, something that we seem very far away from us because we do not have casuistic to, to reason uh, much about uh, failures or other considerations. So it's been a, um, a very good session today. And we are glad to share this topic and congratulations and thank you, Dr. Gomez. So uh, if there are no other comments, uh, we'll see you again in one month. Thank you everyone again for the opportunity and thank thanks you. for the comments. Bye.